Office Space's entire plot is really secondary. It's, it's almost just a device to frame the cutaway skits and the character studies that exist throughout the movie. They're basically the live action argument for the success of Family Guy, which interestingly enough had just started airing when Office Space was released and which would go on to parody Office Space at one point. But you know what? Despite the plot taking a bit of a downturn in the second half of the film, I think Office Space's whole setup is perfect. It's brilliant. And not only because it's a framework that other films, other books use all the time, but because it allows Office Space to give us some of the most memorable moments I have ever seen put on a film. Let's take a look. It all starts with that opening crawl of traffic, a scene that parodies an almost daily occurrence that every single worker has experienced at one point or another, which is probably why it was used so heavily in the original film trailer, albeit with a very different soundtrack. In fact, the whole movie almost had a very different soundtrack because the producers over at Fox, the producers of Office Space, really weren't into all the rap that Mike Judge would use in the film. Thankfully, several focus groups did like the rap, and we have the mastery that is the soundtrack today as it is. But that opening, it's heightened with such scene stealers as, as the dude with the walker, Samir's frustrated, angry inability to even get a swear out. And Michael's hypocritical racism. It was filmed in both Dallas and Austin and reminds me a lot, though I don't think it's an homage to Falling Down, a much darker comedy than Office Space, but home to probably the best ever seen filmed inside of a fast food joint. Turn around, look at that. You see what I mean? It's, it's plump, it's juicy, it's three inches thick. Now, look at this sorry, miserable, squashed thing. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture? The first time you see the TPS report scene, you have no idea what to expect. It's just a, a boss coming over to give a, a friendly reminder about a new policy, right? You see, we're putting the cover sheets on all TPS reports now before they go out. Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. Innocuous enough, even if the boss, Lumberg, doesn't really pay attention to Peter, the employee, in any way, shape, or form at all. Rather typical, actually. But then, it happens again. Hi, Peter. What's happening? We need to talk about your TPS reports. And the frustration, the absurdity of middle management starts to come into the fold. But wait, here's the kicker. A telephone call, his phone rings. Peter's phone rings after the other manager walks away. And no, no, this phone call couldn't have anything to do with the TPS reports. Could it? Peter Gibbons? Yes. I have the memo. Of course, this joke would carry on through the movie with, with Peter mentioning he has eight bosses who come to him every time he makes a mistake and culminates in Lumberg's interview with the efficiency consultants. Yeah, Bill, let me ask you a real quick question here. How much time would you say you spend each week dealing with these TPS reports? And as for what a TPS report actually is, well, the jury's still kind of out at that one because we've gotten several different answers. At the 10th anniversary screening of Office Space, for instance, Mike Judge said that they stand for Test Set Program Reports, okay? But in the DVD extras for Office Space, it's revealed that TPS actually stands for Totally Pointless Shit, when in reality, they can actually stand for Testing Procedure Specification Report. So that's a, it's a QA thing. Personally, I like the second option. It's established 
really early on that one of our protagonists, Michael, really hates his full name, Michael Bolton. Yeah, well, at least your name isn't Michael Bolton. You know, there's nothing wrong with that name. There was nothing wrong with it until I was about 12 years old and that no talent ass clown became famous and started winning Grammys. It's funny and it's timely, but it isn't until much later on in the movie that the brilliance of what seems to be kind of a little throwaway scene, a little throwaway bit, is fully realized as the efficiency consultants, who, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to call them the Bobs from here on out, because it's a lot easier to say. They turn out to be some of the singer's biggest, wildest, most craziest fans. So when Michael says to them, you can, you know, just call me Mike, it doesn't go over too well for him. You know, you, you can just call me Mike. I also want to point out that Michael, in this film, is the only one to break the fourth wall and actually interact with the audience after the temp says, hello, Michael. So I'm chasing bitches like Tom Chase Jerry. I put the Which I never really caught until recently. It was a recent watching of it that I, I realized what she had said. Um, but the scene actually inspired a Funny or Die video uh, a few years back that featured the real Michael Bolton, who is digitally inserted into several office space scenes, with the only thing he changed being calling himself an extremely talented ass clown. My favorite scene in all of office space and the inspiration for my shirt is probably also the most cathartic. The moment when Michael, Samir, and Peter take this godforsaken printer that is causing such pain in their lives and bring it out into the middle of the field and summarily execute it. That's truly what this scene is, an execution, co complete with a bat, fisticuffs, and an amazing accompanying soundtrack. Now, don't get me wrong, I've beaten up a printer before, true story, but this, this is something on a completely different level. It's so well done that AJ Naidu, the guy who plays Samir, said that so-called mobsters have come up to him and said, I like the way you did that printer and it was very authentic. Like my, my take on a little accent there, I, I thought it was pretty good. And honestly, I think it's rather deserving. It deserved that punishment. Now, I hate printers. Printers are the bane of modern technological existence. They are the worst thing. They're the reason why we have electronic mail now, so we don't have to print anything out. Oh my God, why don't they ever work? But this printer in particular deserved it because it actually interrupted and changed a scene. Yeah, the PC low letter scene, not scripted. So maybe you're missing the point. The point of the exercise is that you're supposed to figure out what you would want to do if... PC load letter? What the f does that mean? Michael was supposed to say more, but the paper jammed and interrupted him with that little incessant beeping, and he ad-libbed hysterically. I loved it. I loved that whole scene. By the way, PC load letter? means that the printer ran out of or did not recognize the paper in the tray. Uh, it's not something that we see nowadays, but it was on those older printers. So, yeah, there you go. We get a few dream sequences throughout Office Space, particularly in the latter half of the movie, but there's one that really stands out for me, one that I never not laugh at and of course i think you probably know the one i'm talking about the one in which lumberg f***ed her now lumber 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 that's great not only do we get overly exaggerated takes on that quote and the o face from the criminally underutilized Greg Pitts, we also get the the haunting imagery of Bill Lumberg with Joanna just going at it, well, with Joanna's foot, I suppose. 
as he sits there and drinks his cup of coffee and just harangues Peter for his TPS reports. Peter, what's happening? Um, could you give me those TPS reports ASAP? Fun fact, Mike Judge actually added the coffee mug in at the very last second. And it's pretty funny because to me, it's really what makes this dream sequence stand out. It's just, yeah. And, you know, I think without the coffee mug, the scene would actually come off really creepy instead of hysterically funny. It's just that scene. Ugh. Though most of the Milton focused scenes are pulled directly from, copied pretty much directly from the animated shorts. There's one that that wasn't, and it is actually the most anger-inducing scene for me in all of Office Space. Of course, I am talking about Lumberg's birthday party. Happy birthday to you. The nonchalance of the now 41-year-old Lumberg, the as under enthusiastic as you can possibly imagine singing the the, the happy birthday the, i mean it's so indicative of corporate culture that that whole scene is already a standout but what makes this scene one of the best in the entire movie is the cake or rather the passing of the cake i really really appreciate it it's very special now, Milton, don't be greedy. Let's pass it along and make sure everyone gets a piece. Payable Nina. I mean, if you didn't want to strangle her in the earlier part of the film, you definitely want to do it now. I mean, even after Milton says, last time I didn't get a piece, she still gets on his case about passing. Just pass it. And at the end, Milton does not get a piece. He gets completely screwed. And who is the woman next to him in the glasses? Look at her smug attitude as she simply pretends Milton no longer exists standing right next to her. We have to burn her house down. There's an ongoing side plot throughout the film as Jennifer Aniston's character Joanna is repeatedly lambasted by her tchotchkes manager played by an uncredited mike judge apparently channeling a guy he saw at a kinko's because he added the character too late to cast someone for not wearing enough flair especially as compared to her co-worker brian <laughs> but it all ends with a great big expression on joanna's part you know what yeah i do i do want to express myself Okay, then I don't need 37 pieces of flair to do it. This whole bit works on several levels, and not just because tchotchkes means, uh, you know, small knickknack or trinket, which is basically a synonym for flair, or that the bare minimum keeps coming up again and again throughout the movie, you know, doing just enough not to get fired, or that, you know, the, the, the we're not in Kansas anymore. Not even that tying into the movie's theme but because this is a commentary on an actual practice that was taking place at that time at TGI Fridays. One the movie through Peter compares to the Nazis. And even though the set was actually the Alligator Grill in Austin, Texas, which sadly closed back in 2009, the reference wasn't lost on TGI Fridays and the restaurant ended up, you know, uh, getting rid of its flair by 2005. They come to tchotchkes for the atmosphere and the attitude. Okay, that's what the flair is about. It's about fun. Yeah. That's it for this video, but if you want more from Drunk on Riding on Office Space, be sure to click one of the thumbnails here, or, you know, subscribe to the channel, or head on over to drunkonriding.com. Thank you for watching, and as always, cheers, and keep on riding.